Oh. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar, Rethinking Trust in Data, sponsored by OneTrust. And I'm excited to report I am coming live from San Diego at uh, one of our best uh, our new uh, um, in-person conferences. It's very exciting to be back in person. We have another One Trust session going on at the same time I was telling Shane earlier. I just love it. It's a great day to talk about privacy, security, and governance, uh, both digitally and in person. So just a couple of points, though, to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A panel, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights of questions by Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so and to access and open the Q&A or chat panel. You will find those icons at the bottom middle of your screen for those features. And just to note, the Zoom chat defaults to send to just the hosts and panelists. We may absolutely change that to network with everyone. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Shane Wiggins. Shane serves as a product line manager at OneTrust, the trust intelligence platform, unlocking every company's value and potential to thrive by doing what's good for people and the planet. One Trust connects privacy, GRC, ethics, and ESG teams, data, and processes so all companies can collaborate seamlessly and put trust at the center of their operations and culture. In his role, Shane supports One Trust data governance, including data discovery, data catalog, and AI governance product lines. And with that, I will turn it over to Shane to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening uh, to all of you. Appreciate you joining. Uh, so the kick us off, the explosive growth of data and the value it creates really demands data professionals to improve the priority program. Uh, and this is in order to build, demonstrate, and, and maintain trust. I think the, the era of the fine print, the pre-tick boxes, and the, and the data hoarding, this has passed. And the, the strong collaboration from privacy, marketing, marketing, and ethics teams is really required to drive trustworthy data-driven practices. So in today's session, uh, we'll consider the prominent trends that we're seeing in trusted data and how you can refine your program uh, to account for these trends and ultimately uh, build trust. So Shannon very much appreciates um, the introduction do want to thank you all for joining and certainly do want to thank the Dataversity team for hosting the session uh, in the playing organization that did go into it. So as Shannon mentioned, um, am the, I am the product line manager at OneTrust for our data governance offering. So there's a couple of product lines that fall underneath that. We do have our data discovery engine, our data catalog, as well as our AI governance product lines. Uh, and before OneTrust spent some time with GE, uh, Accenture, and also in the IoT startup space. Um, so I hold a Bachelor of Science in Industrial and Systems Engineering from the University of Florida, Go Gators. And I am CIPPE and CIPM certified, as well as a Lead Green Associate and Six Sigma Green Belt. So I think with this supply chain background, definitely tend to take a supply chain mindset to data and the overall um, flow of data. So let's get to it. So in today's uh, session, we'll start by reviewing the latest industry trends driving both I think, the macro, but also the uh, micro. And trust isn't just in our name, it's within everything we do. So we'll consider four prominent areas to, to focus on when refining our programs. Um, that would be embedding privacy, managing preferences, sustainability and the ethical use of artificial intelligence. And at the end, uh, we'll hand it back over to Shane, hopefully we'll have some time for questions as well. So let's kick off by considering the latest industry trends. Firstly, what, what's driving trust? Well, I think there are three prominent drivers that uh, we should consider. First is the societal change and by that, I mean, pressure from individuals, groups, and society as a whole to respect privacy. I think today, data subjects have high expectations on how their data is used and are concerned with organizations' missions and beliefs beyond just the, the products or the services that they provide. So your people, your employees, your investors, 
they want to trust you and ultimately will only interact with you if they trust you as an organization. Next is the omnipresent changing and evolving regulatory landscape, uh, whether it's in the privacy realm, ethics, or security, all are motivated by requiring organizations to be trusted in different areas and also serve as a tangible sense of urgency driving these initiatives and driving clarity on what needs to be built. And then finally, uh, which falls into the line on the product side is the technology. And I think the, the plethora of powerful tools uh, we now have available to us continues to knock down barriers to entry every single day. Focusing on emerging technology, these tools really do require a, a new approach. In many cases, the, the technology is outpacing the legislation. And this may require us to proactively take responsibility and also self-regulate at times. I think for our organizations, there's considerable opportunity. However, technology can also be uh, the, the greatest source of risk. And that's where we see trust as a competitive advantage. It's not all negative or, or challenging. You know, trust is starting to reap the rewards for organizations that have invested in their programs. Um, and effective and transparency uh, as part of a privacy program uh, it is really a significant competitive advantage over your peers. Um, just considering these statistics that are being displayed, you know, data subjects who, who trust a brand are more willing, more loyal, and prepared to also pay more. Um, but this is this shouldn't really be too surprising. If you consider your own relationships, whether that's with your peers, your colleagues, or your team, um, uh, you know, even someone that potentially services your vehicle, you know, where there is trust, you tend to share more, you tend to commit more, and you tend to spend more too at the end of the day. So what steps are you taking? Moreover, what steps maybe should we take to either reestablish or drive trust? And, you know, maybe some also points around what's holding us back. Um, I think moving forward, there are going to be new elements that uh, we must incorporate. And we need to also refine uh, existing processes. And this is to account for the societal, regulatory, and, and technology changes um, that we see happening day in and day out. And th this doesn't necessarily mean the, the old processes your business has undertaken are, are now invalid. I think it just means that they need to be reevaluated um, in, in light of the rapidly changing uh, landscape that we live in today. Uh, and as an example, you know, encouraging data stewardship in your organization to improve data is, is still going to be fundamentally very important. However, the, the practices for improving data will continue to evolve. Um, so we'll take a look at uh, these four emerging areas of focus in a bit more detail. So the privacy side, we'll consider embedding privacy into our operations. Considering governance, we'll consider how to balance, let's say, data subjects choice with also delivering very strong business value. And from there, we'll consider two emerging areas that we are still learning quite about, um, and that's sustainability and how data and privacy directly impact uh, our environmental programs overall. And, and this is particularly interesting because we mostly see technology as an environmental enabler with things like paper and, and travel reduction. Uh, but there's also th th this other side to it where data has that negative environmental impact. Uh, and we'll get into that uh, as well. And then finally, the, the ethics and the overall ethical application of artificial intelligence. So this is one area where uh, a couple of our teams are, are heavily focused on um, given some of the uh, evolution of this in the past three to five years uh, and looking at how we can really use new tools effectively um, and responsibly. So a lot to get into today, very excited about it, but we'll go ahead and kick off with uh, embedding privacy. So what do we mean by this and what's the value? Uh, at a high level, we mean building privacy into our business uh, as usual processes, but also trying to switch our mindset from a barrier to really an enabler. And 
the, one of the drivers behind the, the need to embed privacy, you know, I think as many of us know, the main driver is the, the seemingly relentless trend of privacy regulations that we are seeing. And there are three things to consider in this space, the, the current regulations, the emerging regulations, but also the evolution of, of both. I think privacy never stands still. And if we want to be compliant, um, uh, neither can we. And I think, you know, it tends to be said that if you're compliant, then, you, you know, you're not moving fast enough. So, you know, when we speak to new hires at One Trust about the, the privacy industry and, and get them onboarded and into the domain, I think one of the things, you know, I'd love to highlight that makes it exciting and also challenging is the fact that it's constantly changing. And I think that's one of the greatest things about the privacy space. It's not all bad or challenging news. Um, it's just, you know, more and more uh, when these baselines and other privacy legislations are established, you know, there's variations and nuances, and we're not necessarily reinventing the, the wheel every time. Um, but it is important to evaluate how you adopt a new regulation, or more importantly, you adapt uh, to changes in an existing one. And I think, you know, Gartner has noted that by the end of 2023, so uh, today, June, about 18 months time frame, you know, 75% of the world's population will have their data protected by some form of, of privacy law. And if we just think about that for a second, so that's approximately 6 billion people whose data will be protected. Now, about half of that 6 billion uh, live in both India and China. And I think this just gives you an idea of the scale of governance that, that's going to be needed. And if your, your organization works with personal data in, in any of these markets, uh, you know, it's important to be ready to adapt and also support the regulations we see coming forward. So considering the regulations and, and continuing on that topic, you know, GDPR seems to be the, the international baseline. And I think for this reason, there's a considerable overlap between regulations. So what we really need to focus on are the nuances between the regulations. In this example, we see the differences between retention and minimization when we're considering GDPR versus the CCPA. And you know, in this case, the GDPR is stricter on both counts. And organizations can be strategic with their specific approach. You, know, you, you may choose to be fully compliant with the common elements of several standards, and tolerate some of the outliers as well. And in addition, an organization may choose to become compliant with the legislation of a market that they wish to enter. And I think this shows respect to the specific region uh, and your consumers that reside within that region. So where's the opportunity if all we are seeing is the expanding regulatory landscape? I think you know, the, the opportunity is to leverage the privacy requirements to build loyalty, and at the end of the day, to demonstrate trust. Uh, these are the things that, you know, we have to do anyway. So, you know, why not take it and turn them into an advantage? I think, you know, the, the, a good analogy I can think of is if you think about environmental features in cars, you know, many are compulsory, but rather than just comply, you know, these manufacturers and OEMs, they're, they're marketing, um, you know, they're out there pitching how clean, how recyclable the vehicles are. Um, and this is ultimately, you know, turning a demand into the, this broader opportunity. And the changes drive privacy programs from being, you know, focused on compliance to really focused on uh, enabling the business and taking it uh, the step further. So how do we start to address some of these challenges? I uh, think first, we need to ensure we are working with real-time information. I know privacy teams, they need a complete and current view. Um, manual methods and you know, legacy stale old data uh, are just not acceptable um, today. And I think secondly, privacy teams need data to be intelligently identified in context. You know, context it is so important in the use of data. And thus any risks or violations can be flagged automatically by um, the system and automation will hopefully continue to drive that. And we need to take an aforementioned context and, and use it to carry out certain actions. So this could be 
reporting a privacy incident, or even fulfilling a data subject access request. And then finally, privacy must be embedded into the data operations. So when we think about the, the process of mitigating a risk or applying control, uh, this really should be done automatically and not left to an individual um, to necessarily do manually. So building on the concept of the return on investment, uh, I think that this graphic and the blue line represents the top 10 most trusted companies. And we can see that over the course of 2020, these organizations truly did outperform their peers with regards to shareholder returns. And th this is a real example of trust driving value for data subjects and the business. And this, this indicates that the data subjects are prepared to pay that premium for trust and they're more willing to share their data with the trusted organization. But of course, with the trust comes loyalty and they may also advocate for their trusted brands to their peers, their families, their network, uh, et cetera. So I think last point before we kind of shift into how organizations are taking the next step in the privacy programs is to, you know, just looking at how trust fundamentally changes commercial outcomes. And this is really why we're seeing organizations begin to make more significant investments, not only in what we refer to as, you know, record keeping, you know, your records of processing, Article 30s, your data map, but how we foundationally invest in trust as an organization. So uh, really appreciate that this slide and some of the value that uh, we see represented and in place um, going forward. So now let's focus on balancing the, that choice with value. How can we deliver value to our data subjects, but at the same time, respect their choices and also walk that fine line between personalization and intrusion? Let's start by considering how personalization is perceived from the data subjects perspective. I think these perspectives were captured by Forrester and each take a, a unique approach. We see some familiar trends here. So, you know, advertisements following you around the internet, the targeting algorithm making assumptions, and then ultimately, you know, targeting you with your incorrect or insensitive ads, um, you know, leads to individual concerns over the security uh, of data that organizations hold and also crosses with the demand for control over personalization. Um, and, and these experiences all impact, um, you know, the data subjects trust of the brands they are engaging with. If a brand virtually stalks, you know, potentially makes incorrect assumptions or presents you know, totally inappropriate insensitive ads, then that will significantly damage the trust relationship. And, and trust is something that takes a lot of time and effort to build, but can certainly be lost in an instant. And this personalization is of course, based on the collection of personal data. Um, and where are we collecting personal data? Pretty much everywhere. And, and this is an escalating problem because more of this data is protected by legislation. Thus, you know, overall, holistically, we need to refine our approach with respect to the, the collection, the use, the storage, and ultimately the retention of the data as well. We also need to be mindful of any of the categories of data we're capturing are sensitive um, or biometric as these require special care. And I think in addition, at any point in time, uh, you know, we must be able to present, rectify, or delete that data should the data subject demand it. As you can see, you know, managing this web of data is certainly a challenge. So that's the bad news. We have, you know, angry, upset data subjects and a data management line that we ultimately have to tame. But flipping that on its head, well, you know, where are the positives? You know, one, the emerging trends in the shift to zero party data. So zero party data is captured directly from the individual or the data subject itself, not indirectly through the use of tools such as cookies. And zero party data usually refers to communication preferences such as 
you know, certain mailing list the data subject wants to be on. So there's a lot of control that is ultimately shifted uh, from the enterprise over to the individual consumer. And when considering zero party data, the marketing websites Adweek noted here, data that comes from customers themselves is almost by definition, the most valuable tool you have. And you don't have to pay a social media company to get it. And they you know, continue noting that smart marketers should turn to first party data first. And in fact, in some respects, the data is free other than you know, the setup costs of your banners and certain preference centers. And this is where we start to see a return on investment and where privacy can lead to profitability. Uh, you know, certainly we invest in some technology and in return you get valuable data, which we previously uh, would have to pay for. And, and this is, you know, certainly a, a new concept and sometimes um, hard to uh, ingest. It's like uh, asking your, your wife or partner what she would like for her birthday, um, or at least laying out some options rather than guessing uh, and getting it horribly wrong, uh, which I'm sure no one uh, has been there before. So building on the concept of zero party data, let's consider an example. Um, here we see the Adidas websites and when navigating to the site, it immediately requests zero party data from the user in exchange for a 20% discount. Uh, it's a trade uh, and potentially a, a win-win. So now, uh, you know, are you getting better quality data? Um, probably, and the data subject is also getting something in return. Um, so wonderful example to um, take and run with. So the data subject has provided us with zero party data. Um, you know, where do we go from now? Well, I think that there's two things that need to happen post this. So first, you know, collecting the data and then ultimately managing the data that you've collected on an ongoing basis. And building on the concept of managing that data, we have a shift left concept. And by that, I mean classifying and rationalizing data at inception, rather than accumulating large amounts of data than trying to figure out what to do with it. And you know, in this specific you know, image, the explorer is climbing the data mountain and the task becomes more complex and demanding the higher he climbs. And this is the same with managing that, that mountain of data that you have. If we classify and rationalize our data at that bottom um, of the mountain, as opposed to the peak, you have a lot more opportunities and you can reduce the amount of personal information collected and thus reduce the risk uh, that presents uh, itself. But when you also obtain more value from the data because early on, you know exactly what it is, why you have it, and what legislation it is subject to. So your business may have data that sits on you know, the right side of the mountain, in the middle. Uh, you may be starting your journey on the left-hand side, uh, but it's important to recognize and ultimately implement solutions such as data discovery to certainly help you and the broader enterprise and your data teams tackle that challenge. So let's look at a practical example. Let's assume we've captured a data subject consent. Uh, we have preferences and we ultimately have that data. You know, they've consented to this data being shared with third party marketing partners. Uh, because we've got, you know, the house in order and we've captured and rationalized this data, uh, when it was collected, we know exactly where it was stored. There comes a point in time where the data subject changes their minds um, for they return to our website, navigate to the preference center and withdraw their consent for data to be shared with third party marketing partners. So what happens next? The next step is for the consent record to be updated. Um, the option to share with third party marketing partners is now updated to be withdrawn. So from here, the system initiates the required downstream actions. It connects to the systems where the data is processed and propagates the consents and the changes uh, necessary to fulfill the request. So the data that was shared with third party is no longer shared and consequently, that organization will no longer be privileged to that data. Job done. 
And this can be done instantaneously as well. Equally, if the data subject changes their minds in a few weeks time, the change can be reversed. So by having a place uh, and a system in place, you know, we are able to meet our privacy obligations. We're able to build trust with that data subject. And we can start to build trust with our third party marketing partners. Uh, because you know they're looking at you know us, and they're confident that uh, they can use the data that they are privileged to as well, uh, reducing the risk ultimately on their side. So to conclude, let's focus um, a couple statistics here. Recent reports produced by Adobe: eighty-one percent of data subjects noted having choices about how companies use their data is important to them. 69% have advised that they would stop buying if companies use their data without permission. 72% noted that relevant content delivered at the right time boosted their trust. And finally, 84% expressed that keeping data safe and providing transparency and controls helps to regain that lost trust. Next, let's consider sustainability and how do we achieve sustainable data practices? Um, I think when going through the different topics to, to cover on this, you know, this, this area is very interesting. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that are still being considered as far as how uh, data usage kind of is classified as responsible. Um, and certainly, I think we're familiar with the privacy side of things and uh, hopefully continue to um, get educated. But in the sustainability side, there's still a lot more to consider. So when we hear about the, the digital era and digitalization overall uh, and the move from manual processes to digital forms to, to automation, we tend to look at this uh, as good news. We've gone from you know, file shares to SharePoint, SharePoint Office, Office 365, uh, et cetera. And each change was a drive towards efficiency uh, and took advantage of the economies of scale um, that came with it. You know, our data was backed up, it was more secure, we could work collaboratively anytime, anywhere. So far, so positive. Yet, few organizations consider the environmental consequences, uh, and the primary one being energy consumption. Data centers use a lot of energy, and more data and more services means more energy. If we consider this graph, we have energy used on the y-axis and um, the time on the x-axis. And we have three lines here, um, best case, expected, and worst case. And what's concerning about all these scenarios is that they all demonstrate exponential growth just over you know, different timelines. If we look at the expected scenario between now and 2030, we have an increase in energy demand of between three and four times. And data centers uh, are currently responsible for about 2% um, of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. And this number is very likely to continue to grow as the demand for digital services grows as well. So businesses that work with large amounts of data or provide software services uh, will use data centers um, and now is really that ideal time to take a snapshot and also start to consider more sustainable data practices going forward. So what steps can we take to reduce the impact? Uh, in any environmental audits, whether that's reducing the environmental impact of air travel or even heating uh, a workspace, um, we can start capturing <coughs> a baseline. And, and we can use this to determine the, the carbon footprint. Um, and at that point, start to consider ways to reduce it. Where you know, the footprint may not necessarily be able to be reduced, we can actually start to identify opportunities to offset that. And I think the same approach uh, applies for data. Um, when we base on, we look at areas that we can reduce the overall environmental impact and offsets where necessary. And, you know, when you look at data and you know, certain redundant, obsolete and, and trivial data, the same type of approach can be had there as well. And how do we kind of simplify this? Are there simpler ways we can reduce the overall environmental impact? And you know, one of the simplest ways is to reduce the data. 
Um, we continue to hone in on the data and I'll say that again, because it, it's not always the most popular uh, I, idea out there. Um, less data though means less storage and less environmental impact. Um, but it's not just environmental gains. There's also you know, financial gains and, and risk gains tied to that. Um, that lesser data, you are reducing the storage costs and also the overall exposure to risk. And this starts with discovery and an audit. You know, why do we have this data? And how long do we intend to keep it? How many people here have used the storage? How many people realized that it was a waste of money or the cost of the storage quickly surpassed the value of the data itself? Um, you know, we must not be blind to the data footprint. And if we're storing data, we need to be able to justify why. And if we can't, we need to consider how to archive it or start to reduce the footprint uh, and potentially delete it overall. And when considering carbon offsetting, we need to be aware of this so-called uh, greenwashing. That is, you know, marketing to sustainability while not actually doing it. Um, so if you're looking to offset your, your carbon production, always look for an organization that is accredited to one of these standards. Um, that way you can be confident that your carbon credits are being invested uh, responsibly and trustworthy. All right, to conclude, let's look at a really hot topic in the privacy space, uh, AI and the ethical implications of its use. To start off with, let's consider one of the emerging concerns, bias. So artificial intelligence is a learning technology and thus it is very much influenced by the data sets it's analyzing. And as a result, the output and the results are influenced by the strength of the algorithm it was designed uh, to use. I think we all you know, remember bad data in equals bad data out. And this slide highlights some examples of bias resulting from AI analyzing certain data. So especially in the context of AI, you know, I, I strongly feel that the data work tends to be much more underappreciated than the model work itself. Uh, I'm a firm believer that the devil is really in the data. Uh, and it's a fundamental part to ensure that you're establishing uh, a trustworthy, responsible AI program as well. So some points to highlight here are gender bias and racial bias. And you may be thinking, well, you know, how can a machine be sexist or how can a machine be racist? It's just an algorithm. Well, there's either a flaw in the algorithm or that's a behavior that's learned over time. And what's more concerning is that artificial intelligence can be manipulated. Uh, if you flood the system with enough biased data, the system may start to believe it's true. Um, for example, if an AI system is learning you know, from survey results and we submit 100,000 surveys, uh, depending on that sample size, that could very well manipulate the results. And there is a concerning statistic from Gartner um, that went through 2030 that 85% of all AI projects will provide false results for the reasons we've just described. Um, and no one wants AI to, to disappear. Uh, you know, we all want it to continue to and improve our day-to-day -day and you know, there's so much uh, potential that it has. Um, so the, the positive news is that you know, we're, uh, we can be aware of it um, and earlier on that that awareness we can recognize also start to address it. And you know, specific to AI and the overall you know, decomposition of how uh, the flow works is the good thing is for the most part, the the data set that is trained on can be modified. And I think with enough effort invested, um, they can become largely unbiased. So our artificial intelligence is potentially racist and sexist. Uh, we're off to uh, a pretty tough start, but what can we do to address that? Well, given the pace of AI, you know, self-regulation is one option. 
uh, making sure that we do our due diligence and we properly audit our data. Um, there are also data protection frameworks we can use that focus on this space. Uh, in this specific slide, we see the European Union, Union Trustworthy AI Guidelines and also the ICO auditing framework. And both of these frameworks define an approach to using artificial intelligence and also account for assessing impact and managing the risk. So the graphics on this slide show our evaluation of each standard based on uh, kind of how our legal experts um, analyzed um, the various scope of the framework. So across six parameters, um, the European standards score high in all areas, uh, and the ICO standard also did very well. Um, but three specific parameters that I'd like to discuss in more detail are impact assessments, risk management, and explaining decisions. So when considering impact assessments, we investigated um, if the framework recommended privacy impact assessments or similar and established when these should be carried out, um, which is positive. When we look at risk management, you know, we took a look at investigating the risk management processes, such as when and how to address certain risks. And then considering explaining decisions, you know, we certainly want the frameworks to be able to cover challenges. Um, and this is sometimes very difficult to do to explain automated decision making. And you know, if you're at the, the hold of a, a decision is you want to ensure that you're able to get the transparency that you deserve as to why that decision was made. I think uh, you know, one example I always use is you know, when you're visiting uh, a healthcare provider and some diagnosis or output was done, um, you know, at that point in time, you're able to ask certain questions and you have that dialogue with the healthcare provider to understand ultimately how that decision came to lie. And the same thing has to be in place uh, for any type of AI system. And implementing a good standards such as the EU or ICO or several more that are starting to um, grow uh, an impact and also doing your own analysis will go a, a long way. And, and this will help you ensure that, you know, AI is delivering good results in a trustworthy way that's not necessarily influenced by bias. So beyond frameworks, uh, AI legislation is coming and it's only a matter of time. In Europe, we can certainly expect to see local laws um, and uh, even potentially that European Union wide law. And I think the same approach is going to happen here um, in the United States. Looking at what's in the, the pipeline specifically from the EU, there's already a draft regulation and the United Kingdom uh, specifically have proposed uh, changes to their data regimen. And the UK are going the, their own way in some respects, but still have the same privacy principles um, as Europe. Uh, considering the Americas, the USA are also introducing legislation and we're starting to see uh, enforcement of that too. As of January, 2023, uh, New York City will ban the use of automated decision-making tools to screen employees unless those tools have undergone uh, a bias audit. So we, it is here, it is coming, and it's growing in scope. So finally, how do we uh, take our privacy principles and relate that to the responsible use of AI? Um, we really see data privacy and AI as intertwined. Um, considering purpose limitation, uh, data collected for one purpose may not be used for another purpose without obtaining additional user consent. In one instance, uh, a lender introduced bias into a loan approval algorithm because there was an inherent bias in using individuals postcodes in the calculations. Um, so considering transparency, organizations must demonstrate that the data selected to, to build their models was evaluated for harm and that bias was mitigated to the degree possible. And I think finally considering risk assessments, embedding risk assessments into the product lifecycle of uh, an AI project can be used to assess the risk and document uh, appropriate actions as well. And I think one thing that is unique that 
we're still trying to get our head around. And I think it's something for you all to, to think about as you start to deploy AI is the, the data deletion conundrum. Um, in, in the lens of AI, exact data deletion uh, effectively means retraining that model from scratch. And doing that requires taking that algorithm offline for retraining. And that costs real money and also real time. And furthermore, the, the challenge here is that even after an organization deletes the data associated with the given individual, information about that individual may persist in certain predictions made by the machine learning models trained on the deleted data itself. Um, so while, you know, first plausible solution is, okay, exact data deletion, um, really you're trying to get to a point where you can reproduce that model as if, you know, those deleted points had been omitted from the training set to begin with. And there's a lot of great studies out there and uh, Stanford and a few other universities are, are really looking into this. And there's a new metric that they're evaluating um, in the lens of data removal from models itself. And they're calling it the feature injection test. So FIT and not to get too technical, but what this metric captures is how well can we remove the model's knowledge of a sensitive, highly predictive feature uh, present in the data. So uh, a ton of great work being out there, uh, being done and um, excited about how we continue to uh, embed privacy into the responsible use of artificial intelligence. So One Trust is an organization um, that we've, we've tried to pioneer uh, the trust software platform over time. And with this unifying and operationalizing privacy governance, uh, ethics, and um, the environment. So we deliver um, to a portfolio of over uh, 12,000 clients across um, all verticals. We have about 3,000 employees, um, you know, 40% uh, around that work in R&D. And the, the innovation and uh, investments is certainly critical uh, in this market. And, you know, very fortunate to have the, the broader OneTrust community and ecosystem. Uh, we look at, you know, 20,000 members uh, continuing to collaborate uh, and drive the future um, of the markets every single day. So when considering one trust, uh, we delivered trust as a unified cloud application across the four pillars, uh, which we discussed today, privacy, security assurance, ethics, and sustainability. And with one trust, um, you know, we can leverage the, the data where required as much as we can to ensure that, you know, we're helping you as an organization maintain compliance, but also utilize the data to benefit your organization. So with that, we'll go ahead and wrap up and very much appreciate y'all's attention. I'll hand it back over to Shannon uh, to take us next steps in the session. Shane, thank you so much for this great presentation. Been a lot of great comments in the chat section throughout. A lot of thought-provoking ideas here um, and, and information. And if you have questions for Shane, feel free to submit them in the Q&A portion of your screen. Uh, and just a reminder to everyone to answer the most common questions, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording. So diving in here, Shane, you know, is CCPA interchangeable with CPRA? Good question. So um, you could look at it to the extent, but how you should really look at it is the CPRA replacing and kind of amending several parts of the existing uh, CCPA. Um, so in 2020, uh, late 2020, um, that's when that was passed. Uh, but that's how you can look at the difference with the new act coming to effect here in 2023. Lots of new uh, privacy policies coming into effect uh, as as we uh, emerge, as you were talking about. So, Shane, what processes and techniques should a company who is developing or licensing an AI technology follow in order to ensure that they are behaving in an ethical and trustworthy manner? Yes, uh, good question. So, I, I think first and foremost is 
when you're looking at an enterprise who's exploring the use of artificial intelligence or has already deployed uh, AI applications, uh, I think the first step is creating the, that AI registry. And what this does is this will uh, enable the enterprise to provide a, uh, you know, that 360 degree view for all stakeholders uh, of where AI is used. Um, it, it's oftentimes very difficult to track across the enterprise. Uh, you have different departments leveraging, you know, AI in different forms and AI can also be sourced um, from different vendors and potentially uh, even developed in house. So we're seeing AI use becoming widespread. And I think in many institutions, uh, it's decentralized um, across the enterprise, which makes it uh, difficult for risk managers to track. So I think that would be the, the first thing. And then, uh, you know, after that is understanding the data. I think, the, you know, it, you got to be able to ask about the data. You have to question the data. Um, and with that, start to focus on the data generation process and the selection and, and the control over um, data sources and um, inputs. Um, kind of hard for me to uh, show with my hands, but there's also this concept of uh, like an ethical matrix. And, and this is a really good foundational baseline to, to start with. And uh, this will help you understand who the stakeholders are um, and to get those stakeholders involved in the construction um, of the matrix. So uh, how it works is that the rows of this matrix or this grid would be um, that the stakeholders and then the columns would be, you know, specific concerns. So what you do is you go through each cell of the matrix and you try to decide, are these stakeholders at high risk for this concern um, and, and how wrong could it potentially go? So once you have that defined, you can look at all those concerns that they might have, whether it be fairness, transparency, false positives, false negatives, and you can consider these holistically and start to balance um, the concerns uh, as well. So I think those are a couple of ways that uh, if you're getting going, um, that you could establish these type of processes and techniques to behave uh, in that trustworthy manner. I love it. And you know, at, along this line chain, you, know, you, you alluded to organizations taking on responsibilities and your dealings with clients. Um, asking for your expertise, you find corporations actually are interested in listening or discussing social responsibilities like reducing bias and things? I'd say it's certainly growing um, in scope. And I think, you know, one key part of this too is AI and the, and the use of AI is starting to be driven a, a lot from the leadership um, side of the house too. And that's um, you know, the ask down to engineering is we need to start to automate uh, X, Y, Z, uh, or we need to inject AI into our certain, uh, you know, customer service processes, or how can we leverage AI to help with this uh, customer experience? And I think when it, it, it's that type of approach, certainly you need to bring them along um, in that journey as well and understand that uh, the impacts uh, are really significant. And I think the more that, um, the awareness of that happens, I think that the better overall the enterprise uh, will be because uh, when you're looking at AI, it's, it's very easy to take the high road and look at everything that it can do. Um, but uh, it takes a really good leadership team to be able to take a step back and understand what it can't do as well. Indeed, data ethics is, is becoming more and more popular as a, as a keyword. Um, when you talked about the stakeholder concern grid, what is an example of a stakeholder? Yes, great question, Lori. Um, so it could vary. Um, so for example, one could be, let's say the C-suite. Another stakeholder could be the marketing team. Another stakeholder could be the data science team. Another stakeholder could be the specific customer. Another stakeholder could be the data engineer responsible for the data set itself. So those are a couple examples and they definitely vary um, as far as the position, but they all are impacted in some form or fashion. And that's where by building out this matrix, you actually get exposure to 
uh, certain stakeholders that you may or may not have thought would be impacted, but actually are impacted at the end of the day. Oh, sorry, I'm talking to, to the mute button there. <laughs> the common issue of these days. <laughs> uh, so Shane, why do you think there's a, a need to regulate AI? Yeah, so I see it a couple ways. So I think if we look just a few years ago, data analysis, it took a specialized team, it took advanced computing, it took a lots of data. Now today, you know, there's, you know, really good platforms, there's open source technology, and this makes it easier to adopt. And on top of that, there's big data sets that just didn't exist um, a few years ago. So I think the, the advent of affordable, prevalent, high compute hardware, and then you couple this with, you know, parallel processing and then emerging platforms that are bringing the cloud-based infrastructure, it, it's made it much easier to deploy AI solutions that are good enough and have good enough performance for real world applications. Uh, you know, if you look at Azure, AWS, GCP, if you have a subscription, you can get up and running very quickly. Um, so what, what used to be run in specialized labs with you know, access to supercomputers um, can now be deployed uh, to the cloud at a fraction of the cost um, and, and much more easily. And I think the digital era and the transformation is certainly helped driving that. Um, you know, Microsoft CEO during the pandemic, they looked at, uh, you know, what was going on and they said roughly two months in the pandemic was equivalent to about two years worth of a digital transformation. So uh, these past couple of years has been really significant and AI has played um, a big part. And then I think, also, you know, kind of mentioned a little bit earlier is that there's this pressure to embed and optimize and deploy proof of concept. So there's a lot of pressure coming from the business um, as well. And uh, this accelerated AI development and adoption, uh, I do not believe it's been matched with the same surge in education and uh, awareness of its risks, uh, which is helping to drive a lot of the regulation that we're seeing coming out. Perfect, and we got a you know a couple uh, additional questions to the to the um, discussion earlier. You know, so to what degree do you think uh, organizations make the effort to assess unconscious bias internally, staff, and externally, customers and partners? Any thoughts on exercises that could be conducted, even sublim subliminally? Yeah, Andrew, um, I think it could could happen in a, a couple ways, and. That's where I think involvement from multiple parties is really important um, because not only do you get different viewpoints, but you know, the, the understanding can be level set across those different individuals. So um, you know, I, I always try, and even internally at, at OneTrust is how do we get the data science team better exposure into the, the operational context of the model that they're building. Um, so I think it's important to continue to have a, a diverse team that's involved in the overall uh, governance program that you have um, for AI and continue to open up you know, the stakeholders that could be uh, included as part of those discussions. Um, so I think to date, the whole concept of you know, a bias algorithm and, and bias data, it's, we're seeing more and more examples of it um, happen in, in real time and in production and out in the field. And, and I'm hoping that this helps to, to drive um, organizations to, to make that additional efforts um, to evaluate these things uh, as early and as often as possible. I love it. Oh, so um, I think we have time for one more question here, at least. Um, then would you suggest to implement AI ethics within the company from the top down? How would you implement a program like that? 
I think it depends on kind of your organization and um, ideally would have it coming from top down, but also have it established fundamentally at the data science and at the data engineering level. Um, and that's where, you know, we try and explore when we look at certain frameworks out there, there's a, a component of it that needs to be resolved and captured and covered by, you know, let's say maybe somewhere more on the, the compliance side of the house or uh, more on the leadership level, but there's, there's a level of technical detail that's very important in the scope of AI ethics that requires more of that bottoms up approach. Uh, when you look at the ones who are very close to the specialty itself and the group of data scientists that you're working with and the data engineers who are responsible uh, for the data helping to feed um, the models, uh, it, it's critical that they're involved. You know, what we've seen is a lot of organizations will try and use maybe a second or third line of defense to help uh, kind of answer a lot of questions and to get the documentation in place and to try and get a lot of these metrics to help kind of quantify and qualify you as a AI governed institution. But what happens is you end up having to go to that first level at the end of the day anyway. So uh, while top down is, is certainly very important for the enterprise overall, uh, it's very important to get that bottom up approach because of the level of expertise and knowledge that they have day in and day out fundamentally to the components that are being used for AI. You know, Shane, the subtext of that question, you know, and uh, the, the question that we get so often uh, about data governance in general, and, and Kelsey, you read my mind in the chat there, any recommendations on how to get buy-in from stakeholders and leadership that see governance as not needed or have already wiped their hand of it because of, it doesn't, because it takes time. Sure, I think, uh, you know, just looking at real world examples and how one um, negative uh, impact out in the field could have significant enterprise uh, impacts to your enterprise and the brand um, itself. You know, all it takes is, is one faulty mistake and um, it's very easy to deploy, but when you look at when an AI model deployment goes wrong and, you know, kind of that, that example where you have to take the model offline, the ramifications of that are extremely significant. And I think those are important things to surface very on uh, early on in the process uh, because that's going to impact the bottom line in, in more than one way. Well, Shane, thank you so much. This has been a fantastic presentation. Very much appreciated as always. And thanks to OneTrust for sponsoring today's webinar. Um, that is all the questions we have for today and it is all the time. Again, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day Thursday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording. Shane, again, thank you so much. Thanks everybody for your time today you. and being so engaged. Have a great day.